Good evening, all of our Healthy Table friends. We are so excited to see you. Uh, this is May. Can you believe it? We started this back in February. Uh, and we have one session left after today. So we are very happy to see you back joining us again today. Um, this session is being recorded. So I just want to remind you all of that. Your cameras and your microphones are enabled because we want to see your beautiful faces and your lovely smiles. Uh, we also want to hear from you, uh, but we do ask that you please keep your, your microphones muted uh, when, when, we're, when you're not talking. I'm getting all messed up because I'm seeing myself, I think. Uh, so uh, without further ado, while we wait for others to perhaps join us, I have a little icebreaker uh, for us, this isn't going to have you running around grabbing stuff. There's no real winners for this one. It's just kind of fun. So let's start. You can go ahead and um, type your response in the chat box. Uh, what, 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 which, what would you rather? You know that game that kids play? Would you rather? Would you rather chocolate or vanilla? Put it in the chat box. I'm a vanilla person myself. Go ahead and type it in there. I see a few chocolates. Where's my chocolate? Vanilla, chocolate. All right, we gotta have some more vanilla folks out there because it looks like chocolate's winning. All right, well, that was, that was fun. How about another one? Uh, are you a surf or turf? Do you prefer seafood or steak? I prefer the surf. I see, I see a little bit of both. It looks like a good mix. Looks like a big tie going on right there. Oh, surf might have the win. I'm not counting it up though. All right, here's another toughie. Cookies or cake? Would you rather cookies or cake? So that's a tough one. I think I'm gonna go with the cookies on that one. And, oh, yeah, it depends. Sometimes it does depend. Maria, it looks like she couldn't make a decision. Oh, neither could Paul. It's a hard choice, yes. <laughs> All right, how about one more? Uh, hamburgers or hot dogs? With the holiday weekend approaching, people might be doing a little bit of cooking on the grill. So is it hamburgers or hot dogs? I'm gonna go with a hamburger on that one. And it looks like hamburgers, mostly for the win. We got a couple, a couple for both though. So uh, just a little fun game to get us started while we get everybody uh, going and admitted. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Marie for our poll question. So kudos to Ginger for all her emojis she had going. She had an emoji for fish and burgers and everything. So um, Kendra, I'm waiting on you to pop those up. And just and the poll should be launched. We have three questions yes. uh, this week for today's session. There's one on slow cookers, conven convection cooking, and pressure cookers. So yes. there's three questions. All you got to do is scroll on down. Yes, and just pick the answer that you like the most. So slow cookers were they introduced in 1970? Do they use less electricity than the oven? Um, do they help tenderize? And it looks like uh, we've got some people already um, answering. Is it a long, low temperature cooker? And then convection cooking, does it use a fan to circulate? You know, takes less time for the food to cook. Um, gives a beautiful browning desire. Kendra, it looks like everybody has answered and everybody is absolutely correct. It is all of the above for every single one of them. Can y'all believe that a slow cooker has been around since 1970? That's wild. I, I didn't know that, but I remember our first microwave when we got it back at home. And I bet it weighed 500 oh. pounds. 
I think it was it's huge and heavy. Okay, Paul said, I remember when it was new. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. And those were great Thank you guys for participating. Okay, and I think the poll should be down now. So I think first up is Judy, right? For uh, We're gonna be covering pressure cookers and air fryers tonight. Um, the new Lesson 5 has, has launched. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. We hope you had time to engage with Lesson 4 on the Healthy Table website, um, where you can find more information on the air fryers and pressure cookers that we present here today. Okay, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Judy Corbis. I'm the Family Consumer Science Agent in Washington and Holmes counties. And um, tonight I'm demonstrating how to use the pressure cooker. And um, this is a really handy tool for um, cooking foods faster, particularly tough cuts of meat, it makes them tender. And um, it's just an easy way to have a quick meal without heating it in your kitchen. So I'm using an electric pressure cooker. And they, um, there are different brands out there, so I'm not going for any specific brand. But um, here, when, when you're starting with your pressure cooker, you have an inner pot, and so all of your food is going to go into there. And so I take this out. This is what it looks like on the inside. And so um, this is where you'll um, you'll put your inner pot inside here. Now you want to be sure that you don't fill your pot more than two thirds full. And I'll see if I can get this to where you can see it um, with the, I'm not sure if you can see it there, let me take it out and see if it'll show better on the like, computer camera. There's a line, there's half full and two thirds. If you're cooking starchy foods like beans and things like that, you don't want to fill more than half full. All other foods fill no more than two thirds full. And you can use some mark there on the side. Now tonight I'm going to demonstrate baby carrots, and um, basically they have, they have a short cooking time, so I thought they would be a good dish to use um, for the demonstration. So I'm making about half of what the recipe calls for. The recipe is on the Google site, so you can access it. Um, so I'm using a one pound bag of baby carrots. Those in. Then I'm going to add some brown sugar, some margarine, I use just a little bit of salt. I'm not one for putting a lot of salt in my food when I cook, so just a little bit of salt. And then we're going to add water. You want to use about a half to one cup of water in there, um, a minimum, in your pressure cooker. Pour that in. And then we're going to put our lid on. Now, on the lid, there is the pressure valve, and then this is a floater valve. You want to be sure to close your pressure valve, and then when the pressure builds, this little floater valve will pop up, much like it does on a pressure canner. That way you know there's pressure, and you cannot open the lid once this little floater valve goes up. So we're going to put it on. It makes, mine makes a little sound. You twist it closed. I'm going to move it over here to where you can see the controls a little bit better. Adjust my camera down. Okay. Now, when you plug it in, it's set to off. The off number will, off message will appear. We're going to set it to four minutes on high pressure. So you're going to come over here and do the pressure cook. Now, mine will remember what the last thing I cooked. You can also adjust your pressure up, low to high. So we're going to cook it four minutes on high pressure. You can also adjust your time up or down so you can adjust it. And after about 10 seconds, after you, you get your time to adjust, then it will start. It's going to see in just a moment, it's going to go to on, okay? And it's beeping. Now, you also want to be sure to close your pressure valve. Don't do what I did the first time I used my pressure cooker. I 
turned it on and thought I had everything going. I was over at the sink and I hear this hissing sound and I turn around and look and steam's coming up and I've forgotten to close the valve. So be sure to close the valve and that will help to build the pressure up. Now this is gonna take roughly nine to 10 minutes to build up to pressure. At that point, the time will show back up and the timer will start going down. Um, it's, it'll start the timing process. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and cut over to Jill and let her get started um, with her demonstration. We'll be going back and forth between our demonstrations. So Jill, take it away. Okay, thanks everybody. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes? Okay, yeah. perfect. So today um, I'm going to demonstrate how to deconstruct a chicken um, or spatchcock a chicken. So this is called spatchcocking and what we've got here is our full bird. Okay, I've um, got him laying breast side down, him or her, okay, probably or her, but uh, I've got upside down. And the first thing I'm gonna do after I open uh, this out of the package is I'm gonna look for any uh, leftovers that we don't want <laughs> inside the bird. Earlier I had one with quite a bit in there. There's some extra fat here on the bird that I don't want. So I'm gonna take either a knife or some cooking uh, kitchen shears and just cut away at that. Okay, cut that right off and discard it. All right, so for this bird, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut through the backbone. You can see right here is the neck of the bird. And this here is the backbone. You can kind of see it. You can also see that uh, there's muscle around that backbone and there's almost a line here where it's a little bit tougher looking. So that's how you identify that. What I'm gonna do is either take a strong pair of kitchen shears and cut through. And actually, I don't know if these ones, these were kind of cheap, so I don't think they're gonna cut, but we'll use our knife, okay? And I'm gonna cut through this bone, okay? And I'm gonna keep my fingers away from the knife, obviously. We want you to keep your fingers still. Yeah. <laughs> Marie said she would be the 911 caller <laughs> if I lost something tonight. So we got to get, though, a really sharp knife. Remember, you don't want something that's dull because it's more likely to slip and, and slide around. So we're just crunching through that bone, putting our muscle into it. And here we go. We've got that pulled apart. We're going to do the other side. Okay. I said this is some good therapy for some days. You know, take it out on the chicken and you're gonna cut all the way through. You're just gonna pull that backbone out, okay? And say, you don't have a backbone and get rid of it, okay? Here we've got, if we flip this over, okay? And press down. I think I already broke the uh, breastbone earlier when I was pressing down. We've got what's called a spatchcocked or butterfly chicken. Now, the reason that we do this um, or that we might be interested in this is that this nice flat bird is going to cook a lot quicker, keeping in moisture. Um, it's perfect for the grill, easy to uh, flip over, get both sides, gets all of that skin nice and crispy. You know how much we like that skin, um, but when it's soggy, it's not so good, right? So one thing you can do is clip off the wing tips because those will most likely burn. If we want to continue with this processing, we're going to start with um, the arms, okay, the wings, I should say. And what we're going to do is we're actually looking for these joints here where the chicken uh, moves, okay? And we're gonna cut through those joints. What we're cutting through is not so much bone as it is cartilage. So it's uh, not quite as hard to cut through as possible. Now, if you get really stuck, I don't want you to keep going and going, just kind of adjust your knife. You just might not be in the right spot. That kind of happened to me um, 
a little bit earlier. So we're gonna take, you might get some of this breast meat and that's okay. We're gonna take this, we're gonna press down and adjust this a little. See, like I said. <laughs> There we go. Have to adjust that and cut this wing right off. That one was a little messy, but it'll taste good nonetheless. Now what we want to do is cut off the drumette and uh, the rest of the wing. So again, we'll just take this. I'm gonna cut through this skin. And notice that um, I've got some paper towel here to soak up the juices. When you really get going on this, uh, it does tend to get a little messy. I didn't, um, I did drain my chicken earlier because it had a lot of uh, juice in the bag. And um, I just didn't want it to make a big old mess. So I did drain it earlier. Okay. And again, we're just gonna press down. There we have the wing and the drumette. We can take off this wing tip. And this is good for stock or just toss it away if you like. So the reason that we're doing this is not just to take out our, our anger and frustration. And here I'm cutting away the thigh and the leg. Okay, is um, because we want to do a few things. One, we want to have some control over our food, right? And uh, be able to make what we want to eat the way we want to eat it so that it'll be healthy and satisfying. Two is that um, it really does help save some money. When you buy whole birds, they tend to be less than uh, already uh, taken apart pieces. So just some really good reasons to be doing this other than a workout. Here we so are. This is your primary form of exercise. Yeah, right. Doing? Well, it's a little bit harder to do when you know you have people watching you too. So. <laughs> But really, I mean, all in all, you do some practice this, it really doesn't take long and uh, you're able to serve chicken just the way you like it. Now, I mean, I know we spend a lot of money for boneless, skinless, right? And look how easy it is to take off that skin. Okay, really. It really looks so easy, Jill. I know, right? <laughs> so I've got, um, yeah, I've got muscle, Kendra. <laughs> okay, we've got our chicken uh, leg right here. And then of course, I'll spare you the, the sights of the other side, but of course we've got the chicken breast. So we can just cut through the center here. Again, I kind of broke that earlier, but if you didn't, you would just press down. We're gonna cut the skin aside. And then right here, let's see. Right here, actually, this hanging out here. Let me see if I got it over here. We've got chicken tenderloin right here. This is the really tender, good stuff. You know, chicken tenders. Okay, we've got the chicken tenderloin. This is nice and moist. It's been covered by the chicken breast, just that thin little strip there. And here we've got the uh, chicken breast. Again, you've got some bone here, but it's really as simple. If you had a boning knife, you could use that, but you almost can just tear this right off or trim it off. And you've got, and it's, it's it, like I said, it really does help some days <laughs> to do this. Makes you feel good. And you've got your boneless, skinless chicken breast. So really simple, really easy. Um, again, if you want to cook your whole bird, um, 
you know, that's an option. It's nice to have these on hand, or you can deconstruct it and, um, you know, use different parts of it. What I would probably do, because it's just me at home, um, so cooking for one or two, okay, is separate this bird and then freeze it into different serving sections and things like that so that, uh, you know, I can take it out and, and use as I like. So. so Jill, we have put in the chat box your little poll question, does the chicken have a wishbone? And I'm looking to see if anybody at all is going to answer that. And I like the idea that you just demonstrated where that little tenderloin is too. Yeah, yeah, that tenderloin there. That's the, the golden piece, okay? Um, the we, have, a we have no takers on does the chicken have a wishbone? <laughs> well, the chicken does have a wishbone, okay? Um, and it is in here somewhere, but at any rate, it's, on, it's in the front of the chicken breast. It's kind of like two pieces that have been fused together, just like a turkey. It's a small little wishbone. I probably threw it out in that mess. Otherwise, I would have showed you. Okay. After the Unless we're... Fish. So let's remind everybody that we do cook chicken to 165 internal temperature. Yeah. And should yeah. I rinse my chicken, Jill? No, what would be the fun in that? Then how would you get so messy? Um, <laughs> you definitely, a lot of people want to rinse it because it's kind of gross, right? But uh, when you rinse your chicken, you actually um, are not doing it any good. So when you rinse your chicken, you're rinsing off what, what you think are maybe the germs or the juices, but you really want those that chicken to cook in its own juices, keep it nice and moist. And then when you're rinsing, you're actually washing that bacteria and spreading it throughout your kitchen. So you don't want to rinse that chicken off or your Thanksgiving turkey, okay? Any other questions? Uh, I'm still stuck on the wishbone. Can you dry it and pull on it like the turkey wishbone? I don't see why you couldn't, Kendra. Um, I just think I might have actually just a little piece right here. Kendra, it, this is a little piece of it right here. So yeah, you could dry it. Um, you could dry that. That's half of it. I broke it. Um, I don't know, it doesn't look like I got the bigger piece. I think the chicken won. Um, <laughs> but you could. No, no. I did, I posted that my parents used to cook chicken like this a lot. And we, my brother and I used to, like we couldn't wait to find it in there. So oh, yeah. my dad would dry it out a little bit while he was cooking it or my mom, whomever. And then we would um, do it after dinner and we just couldn't wait. That was like, I mean, it's much smaller than a turkey one but still fun, especially if you have small hands and you're still a kid. Yeah, if you're still a kid, just make sure they don't hang on to it. I remember the right. reason I always got the wishbone at Thanksgiving, and um, I don't know how that happened, but uh, that was always a fun pastime. Right. So I don't remember what I wished for, though. So, probably this. <laughs> so, any All other right. It looks like Judy is um, ready. We're ready to, Jill, are you at a good stopping point? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go wash my hands and um, get ready. Okay, for we're we're going to head back to Judy for a few. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, this heated up a lot faster than I thought. I think it's because the food had set up a little bit was warmer than when I um, had made the dish the other day. So it has already finished the processing time. Um, I had my microphone on. You may have heard the beep when it finished. So four minutes, it doesn't take very long at all. And you'll see here, it says L two minutes. So it has finished the cooking cycle. And with this recipe, you can quick release your pressure. Now, um, to do that, to um, release it, you can go ahead and turn it to cancel. And that will turn it off. And then what you want to do is raise this a little bit so you can see it a little better. We're going to take the spoon and we're just going to move the vent forward. I want to be sure that it's aimed away from you, away from the cabinets. 
So that way you're not burning yourself or damaging your cabinets. So it takes just a couple minutes for it to be pressurized and it sucks the steam out. And when the little rotor valve pops down, then we can open the lid. This also has a feature for keeping warm. So you can turn it on and you'll keep it warm. Um, but to help with the um, pressure, if you turn it off, that will help the key up. Don't turn the key on and off. So it will lower the pressure faster. Let's see, it's kind of loud and talk over. And there are, two, there are two basic ways to release your pressure. The one is natural release. And this is when you leave the steam valve closed and you just, the pressure, once you turn your um, cooker off, it will gradually go down. The quick release is used like this. The quick release is more for vegetables and seafood, foods that have a more sensitive cook time meats, soups and stews, and typically starchy foods you want to do the natural release. Always follow the guidelines um, that come with the recipe. Sometimes they tell you to natural release for so many minutes, and then you can quick release any remaining steam, but always follow the directions, especially the starchy foods, or you can end up with the foods, the foamy foods like rice, grains, those kinds of foods bubbling over and then they clog your drain valve and the vent pipe and you have a royal mess on your hands to clean up. So always follow the directions. Just like in pressure canning, there are no shortcuts. So you want to follow the directions and that will help you have a more successful product. Okay, if you could little click the um, float valve um, pop down. So now when we get ready to open, you turn the lid, you see in the front here, there's um, open and close. So you turn it, when you open the lid, open it away from you so you don't steam your face and let the, any condensation drip into the pot. Okay. These pot holders, and I took this because we're stirring it. So we're going to stir and mix our, mix it together. Toss in the sauces, I think is what the recipe calls for. Put that in a quarter or a serving bowl. You can drain these two. I'm not going to drain them right now. You can drain the juice out. And we will garnish with some parsley. This came from my herb garden. And you have baby carrots in just a short period of time. And um, if I have time, Jill, do you need to go, do we need to come back to you? Or? Um, Judy, can you show us your carrots? We can't see them. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. And they kind of, with that brown sugar, they caramelize. And yes. they they really have a really great flavor. So don't sell it short. It's a new technique, but they really, you know, adding that brown sugar just helps that caramelization product process. And they really, really tell, turn out well. So, wow. And the anyway. high heat really helps to create more robust flavors in food. So you think, well, cooking liquid, it's not going to be very tasty or very rich flavors, but really the steam helps to infuse the flavors into meats and things. So it really helps give it a better flavor. And um, this, cook, this um, pressure cooker cooks on high, about nine to 11 pounds of pressure. Um, so it's cooks about twice as fast as regular cooking. And you save time. It cooks about a third of the time in conventional methods. So if something's going to roast, it normally takes two to three hours. It can cook in about 20 to 40 minutes. 
And if you're doing um, cooking beans that are soaked, that will cut the cook time down to about 13 minutes. So it really saves a lot of time, a lot of energy. It keeps your kitchen cool. You also don't have a lot of the mess. You don't have the splatters because everything is self-contained in here. So as long as you don't make a mess getting it into your inner pot, um, you have very little mess to clean up afterwards. So again, you want to always follow the guidelines for um, filling no more than two thirds full, half full if it's a starchy food, and you add a minimum of a half cup to a cup of liquid. And this should be like water or broth, not anything thick like a tomato sauce or barbecue sauce. Again, that can clog up your vent pipe. Um, and we've talked about the natural release methods. Always follow the directions given. You know, even though you may be a patient, you may be running behind, do not, or else you'll spend a lot more time cleaning up your um, lid afterwards. Um, some of the features, some of the pots have a delayed setting feature on it. It's been pointed out on mine. It is here, delay start. For food safety, it's recommended that you don't set that to start more than an hour after you put everything together or else you run into the risk of bacteria growing in the food. So if you're on assemble it, and then maybe you're starting something else and you want to this, delay the start, be sure you do it within an hour of putting the food in the, into the um, pressure cooker. And then that way you re reduce the risk of food safety issues. And you cannot can in a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker is designed for cooking food, not for canning. So if that's some of your questions, you cannot can in a pressure uh, cooker. It says that it's okay to can in it and there's a canning button. I um, still would not yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a lot of them advertised like that, but they've not been approved. Is that correct? That is correct. They have not tested, um, but USDA has not done testing. And so we cannot, you know, guarantee the safety of those or the recipes and whatever. So I do not can use a, a pressure canner using USDA guidelines for pressure canning and use a pressure cooker for cooking meals. Um, I also wanted to point out real quickly in your resource book is this um, guide that was um, shared, prepared by some of our colleagues in Idaho at the University of Idaho Extension. And they were so kind to share those with us this evening. So those are in on the Google site in your resource um, section. And it has a lot of good information on caring for your pressure cooker um, and a lot of other tips. So I encourage you to check that out as you um, explore your cooking with your pressure cooker. Um, Jill, and then I'm going to turn it back over to you so you can start us with the air fryer. Okay, hey, yeah. great. Did you have something to add, Marie? Oh, I was just going to say that also um, that be sure to use a reliable source for your pressure cooker recipes and realize that you can do all of your prep work also in your pressure cooker. You can saute your vegetables that are going to be in your soup or whatever. And again, I, I cannot stress it enough. What Miss Judy said is absolutely true. Do not use really thick um liquids to try to uh, cook with because it will burn or scorch and, and it will turn off. It will give you an error code. So they are, they will turn themselves off. So that again is another safety feature. So if you don't have one or if you do have one, but you were scared to use it, which I've had people tell me that don't be try something really simple and you'll be surprised. All right, Jill, I'm going to let you go do the pressure of the, air fryer now because I'm waiting on you to sell me on this. Yeah, yeah. So I was a hard sell on this actually because I thought I got this big monstrosity and I thought, oh my gosh, this isn't worth it. I did a few things in it and I was like, ah, not buying it. But the more and more I got to use it, uh, the more and more I liked the, the air fryer. We've got a couple of different models here just to show you some variety. Um, there is this air fryer basket model, okay, that I'll show here. And so it's got a basket. I don't know where I'm going. Anyway, it's got a basket. I was trying to, this way. I was, <laughs> that you fill up with your food. This actually has a little um, lid on it. 
so that I guess I misplaced all well, that's hot so it's got a little lid on there so that your food's not flying around um, in the air fryer and you just kind of put it in here um, this one and this is still cooking this one here is called an air fryer oven so it's the same type of technology except it's not that basket um, uh, set up so this actually has I'll just show you this model um, has a couple of different trays that you can use to put foods in okay and uh, you just slide them in this is really hard to do backwards so you just slide them in put your food in there and use it the same way you would this model here here we have a basket that you could put like fries or something in and this will actually turn you're going to use uh, this little lifter here to insert it in there so that your fingers don't get scorched. There is a spigot on this one so that you can do small chickens um, and Cornish game hens and things like that in there on this on the spigot and do like rotisserie style at home. A lot of fun actually um, to do great results. So the way that these air fryers work is that they heat up to these different temperatures um, almost the same as your oven, 200 uh, degrees through 450 or 500 degrees, but they've got this high powered fan in there. And it's kind of like a convection oven where that fan spins around this heat evenly so that it cooks all the different sides of the food. Um, sometimes on your basket, okay, you might be instructed, here we can take that out, to actually flip your food over at some point during the cooking process, I'm just letting you know, y'all, that this smells really, really good. I've got some chicken in here that I cut up earlier. Um, I'm actually going to turn it off for the moment. Um, but uh, so it takes that hot air and it whirls it all around the food so that it cooks up nice and crisp. Uh, on the outside and stays tender and juicy on the inside. And I did do a, a bird in here. I didn't do a rotisserie. I just put this on the lowest setting and um, put that two or three pound bird in there. And oh, that skin was perfect. It was really good. So I, I am sold. Maria might have to bring this over next week when we uh, are working on our projects and we might have to give it a whirl. But uh, the nice thing about these, the, the real big thing, because I have a smaller home, um, you know, I, I really am picky about what takes up my counter space. So but the nice thing what sold me is that the food cooks so fast in here, it's generally about 30 to 50% faster because you've got that air going all around and rather than radiant heat, like from your oven where those elements heat up and it's just kind of hot. This air spinning around, getting the food, um, cooking it much quicker. So um, it cooks quicker and it doesn't heat up your whole house. Like I said, I have a tiny home and I, uh, I just, the thought of in the summertime, heating up my oven to 400 degrees really just does not make me happy <laughs> or feel comfortable. It works my AC a lot. And um, I know it takes a long time to heat up and cool down and these don't take nearly as long. You're starting to find some more options with these. Um, air fryers, you even see there are ovens with air fryer um, air fryers now built in, but I just, like I said, it's hard to, for me to give up counter space, but I'm happy I did with this. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> so here, I'm just going to show you in the basket, we've got some chicken. Let me get, I think I set this on. We've got some chicken that we cooked or that I cooked. Okay. I'm just going to open that up and show you. I don't know if you can see or maybe you can switch to my other yeah. camera. Nice. There we go. We've got the overhead view. Okay, it, so how long did that take? This took about 
I'm gonna say 15 minutes to cook, okay? And I did not flip this over. Um, I probably could have or should have. Now, I've not checked the temperature, haha. Of course, we still, even though it says it's gonna take half as long, we still need to check the temperature of these foods. So we're gonna use our, our thermometer here. We're gonna put it into where? Not the bone, don't hit the bone. Don't hit the bone, but the thickest part, is that right? So yes. we're gonna put the thickest part and we're gonna wait until it reads 165 degrees. Now, if we wanted to cook our whole chicken here, where would we put that thermometer? Who can, who can remind me where the thermometer goes in the whole chicken? If you wanted to say do the rotisserie. When we check the breast, because isn't that the, one of the thicker parts? It is one of the thicker parts. Um, you could check the breast, that's a good indicator, but you wanna put it in to the thickest part of the thigh and not hit the bone, okay? And check that for, uh, to make sure that we're done. Now, a lot of times you'll hear, what's, what's the common thing that we hear that signals chicken is done? When what? Smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's called overdone. But when the juice, when the juices run clear, right? Have you ever heard that? No. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it's not pink inside and the juices run clear. And that's a good indicator, but it doesn't really tell you the temperature um, that the chicken is. That's a good indicator though, to tell you that it's time to check. Okay. Check and see if the if the chicken has reached. Um, that 165 degrees. Now, if I wanted to crisp up this other side, what I could do is just flip this over, put it in for about maybe five more minutes and that would crisp right up. So air fryer is a lot of fun. And the way that I prepped that, I'll just show you real quick, is that I took this uh, spray bottle that I have that you can put olive oil in and I just sprayed my chicken. Okay, sprayed my chicken breast. I took my favorite salt-free herb mix and sprinkle it on. And then into the air fryer. It was that easy. One of my, okay. sorry, what? So I guess it gave it, gave it away to everybody. I buy rotisserie chickens and come home <laughs> and use that. Or either I use canned chicken like, I've canned myself. Yeah. I never mm -hmm. do the other step. I'm going to, I may have to try it. I may have to break down and find one. Yeah. Now, if you don't have like a mister like this, but you're trying to maybe coat your chicken with some olive oil or something and you want to limit because right we're a healthy table, we want some good fats, but not a lot, not too many uh, fats. You can also use a brush to brush that chicken and coat it evenly just to really help crisp up that skin. Uh, one of my other favorites, Marie, in here is just vegetables done that way or even uh, acorn squash fries. That's an office favorite. Just slice that acorn squash about a quarter inch thick, make it look like French fries and toss them into the basket with my favorite seasoning of the day and off we go. About 10 minutes later, we're done. Oh, that sounds good. That sounds really good. Do you put any kind of, do you brush it with any olive oil? Do you do anything at all or is it just air? You know, it's really up to you what you like. Um, sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. <laughs> sometimes okay. I don't know if I don't have the olive oil handy, then it just goes in. It's not going to hurt it. It's just, you know, um, a different spin on cooking. You can, and you can use any oil we like. Of course, we want to choose oils that have more good fats, uh, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, and because um, those are cholesterol lowering um, when, we are, when we're doing things like that. I uh, also love this for crisping up food. Have you ever brought French fries home? And not here, of course, the healthy table. But if you brought French fries home or something and tried them the next day and they're just soggy, this will crisp them up, heat them up. It's really a great 
handy tool and they're priced anywhere from like I'd say $35 all the way up to $200. They have fancy gourmet ones with celebrity chefs, um, but they all work the same way. I tell people, you know, usually what you're buying is a special feature or uh, something that you like, a color. <laughs> So the one you have your hand on, is that like a $35 or a $50 model? Yes, that would be. And it's a smaller model. So this isn't going to feed, you know, a family of six um, or eight, but it will do one or two or three even. So okay. you may All have right. to do a few different um, batches for this one. If you get, look, I get about half a chicken in there. So Okay. Small. So we have a, a, a note in the chat box that um, one of our participants has done a rotisserie chicken and baked two little Cornish game hens also in theirs. And then uh, her husband uses it for sweet potato fries. And I love sweet potato fries. So uh, you're, you're making me move a little bit closer to biting the bullet and buying one. And yeah. Kendra also put in there, she roasts cauliflower in hers, and I love roasted cauliflower. That's a really great idea. I've even made some little um, pizzas in there, like on a tortilla shell. The only thing you have to be careful of is if you put it too close to the fan, you might have some flying around. <laughs> <laughs> live and learn, live and learn. Yeah. Okay. Same I got um, really a nifty, cool, um, new kind of gadget for the, uh, for the kitchen. Um, whether or not you decide to get one, you know, up to you, but it kind of might help those people who are looking to move away from deep fried foods and still maintain that crisp texture um, and make some healthier choices. So I don't fry anything in my house and that might be my go-to because I'm thinking about like okra out of the garden and things oh, yeah. like that. And my husband loves fried okra and I just resist doing that because I don't want the, the extra fat that would come with that. So what about any in the instructions? Do they have any concerns about um, what type of oil you use? Because I know you've been saying olive oil and I know olive oil is generally not a high heat oil, but you've had no issues. No issues uh, with any different oils that I've used or seasonings. Again, you just wanna make sure like on this one here, um, because that fan is up on top, you wanna make sure that uh, that it's not flying away or too close, too high, let's say, um, and too close to the element. So I could really pile up a pizza and, and get that really close. Um, but no issues with the, because we're, we're still at, um, you know, temperatures similar to our oven. So whatever you can cook in your oven, uh, whatever oils work well or whatnot, you can cook in here. You're just going to reduce that cooking time by okay. about 50 percent. So I'm going to ask the other question, the other burning question that I know that all these people are thinking about, cleanup. Okay, so cleanup is surprisingly really easy, I've found. Um, I was, that was one thing I was really concerned about. Um, so this one is my friend's and I know she uses it all the time. Um, it's got to be easy to clean up because it came to me just about spotless. Uh, it looks like this is made with a nonstick coating in here. And I know that this model also has nonstick. Um, I did use, I did have some drippy foods in there that kind of got to get into the corners, but it cleaned up a lot easier. Um, there were spots, some spots I saw today and thought, oh my gosh, I have to get these out before I present this. <laughs> and um, they, you know, I put a little bit, just a little bit of elbow grease, a normal sponge, and most of them came out real easy. I may try a little um, baking soda to get the real hard stuff, but the trays uh, on this one and uh, are actually dishwasher safe. So I just pop these into the dishwasher and they come out nice and clean. 
So. Awesome, awesome. So there are um, a few notes in there. Uh, one person said they used theirs and made pot stickers. Kendra mm -hmm. says hers is super easy to clean. That's highly important in my world. Uh, <laughs> and then they, uh, let's see, um, the last note is we also like that doesn't heat up the kitchen and the rest of the house. Our trays can go in the dishwasher. So again, awesome. Okay. I found, I found it was really surprising because I really bought it only because I had clients asking about it. So I was not like really interested in the air fryer or, um, you know, interested in having one at home. I just, I just, uh, you know, the more I got to use it, the more I preferred it. Especially. Okay. Jill, I have a question. Um, we just got one, so we haven't even tried it yet. Um, my husband wants to know if you've tried bacon in it, cooking bacon. I've not, but I've seen people who have. Was it bad? Was it super messy? No, no, oh. I've not. Okay. I've heard of people who have. Oh, okay. Have. Now this one here, um, this one here has a drip tray also. Oh, okay. Okay. So what I've done um, in the case of something that maybe wasn't, I thought needed more support or might be drippy is I've lined um, these with a little bit of parchment paper. Okay. Okay. Uh, just so that it wouldn't get totally all over. Now okay. I'm going to try <laughs> Yeah, bacon is my, my not my favorite thing in my air fryer. So the big one or some of the larger ones might be able to accommodate it more. Mine is just kind of a small basket one. Uh, but I also prefer my bacon pretty crispy and it just didn't get there in the air fryer. And I'm thinking that in this one, if I put it on the top, it's going to kind of fly up and move around. Um, this one here, like I said, has this little uh, top on it. So it's gonna keep that in place, but it might it might not get as crispy since it's still in that liquid a little bit. So thank I'll, you. I'll try it and report back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Any other burning questions yeah. out there? Anybody have any questions? What are we gonna try? What's a, anybody gonna? Try something, Melanie. You said you just got one. Besides bacon, is there something else that um, you I want? I definitely want to try. Um, you know, just um, French fries or something in there, just out of total curiosity, if they are still crispy enough for me. But um, definitely vegetables. I've heard that that one is a big hit with even kids. Yeah, yeah, they're really good in there, and they cook super fast. You only need, um, you know, five minutes or so on those veggies, but I just love that it crisps things up. I think I put um, shrimp in there also to like heat back up um, so that it wouldn't dry out, but maintain, you know, a little bit of its uh, texture and things like that. Wow. I will say two great demos tonight. Congratulations, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you both did a great job. It was great. I uh, dropped the survey for uh, tonight's session and the lesson four content into the chat box. So please uh, fill out the survey. They really help us to uh, improve our program and other important feedback. Uh, so share your thoughts and how it's going for you. Uh, I want to give a plug to our next session, which will be held same time, same place on June 22nd. And we are gonna have a little celebration. So uh, we'll tell you a little bit more uh, when Jill emails you the reminder, um, but we're, the lesson is entertaining and special occasions. So we're really gonna have a little bit of fun with uh, wine and uh, appetizers. So we invite you to uh, bring a glass of wine if you would like to our last session and come enjoy it. It's going to be the last in our series and uh, we want to celebrate uh, and get to know you all a little bit better with some fun. So I'm going to stop this recording and that way if anybody has any questions that they want to ask off the record, you can do that.